Hello, Mystery Report newsletter and Tutor Program subscribers and and everybody. This is Terrell from Terrell03.com. Today is Monday. It's the 19th of September, 2022. It's 10.05 a.m. Central Time here in the Ozarks. And I um, hope you'll bear with me. I'm struggling a little bit. And I really want to get this report out. More on that on the related issues and things in my Black Star report. I want to focus on uh, on this mystery report. It's been some time since I've been able to make a mystery report. And I'm jumping on this. Just got out of the garden. We're going to have garden pictures and things to share in the Black Star report. So check for the 19th. Some of you might be seeing this later down the road. Over at uh, Brighteon, there is no more uh, Terrell Black Star YouTube channel. It was taken down. Saw that coming. So, uh, this uh, newsletter program is all about helping people see God's wisdom hidden in plain sight using His three witnesses of spirit, water, and blood, testifying in the Holy Scriptures from Genesis 1 1 through Revelation. Genesis 1 1 is where the key is inserted. And once you understand that key, you understand the doors and how to unlock the doors, you start seeing the three witnesses everywhere they're everywhere places you would least expect and once you begin seeing them then you see them everywhere and you see them within yourself and within others and then what's going on in your environment what's going on in the cosmos literally everywhere you look you'll see three witnesses spirit blood and water it's really something for those that see it then it's it's like children with a new toy on christmas morning for those that can see it god has to choose you to see his his wisdom and he does it in generally in series of steps just like the revelations that came through with the Apostle Paul he saw some things some things he could not see at the beginning of his ministry when he was writing to the Thessalonians for example by the time he was in prison in the prison epistles he's writing about the mystery and things that are according to the revelation of the mystery later on in his after the close of the book of Acts after about 61 AD so whenever those things were coming in. So there's a time chosen by God for everybody to see these things. And in heaven, we're going to be able to see them written everywhere. On the standards, on the walls, on the symbolism, everywhere. You'll see overlapping circles and three witnesses. you see gold and red and uh, blue. Much like the visible spectrum of light with the red and the blue on each end. Then uh, these are, it says recent, but Crystal interviewed me back in 2019. And Royce, bless his heart, he's with the Lord now. And uh, these are older um, video, uh, questions and answers videos. And this was before, it was after the Mystery Explained was written. It was written in 2005, in the summer, after decades of research. And then finally published in 2017. And these are, this is uh, thanks to John, that he downloaded each of these 21 presentations and then he edited out the Black Star Report part. This was at Awakened Radio. And so there's a lot of lessons that are right here. If you can just get your hands on a Mr. Report newsletter, there's one free at tarot03.com that you can download. Get your get access to these things, and then for those that want more, go and subscribe. It's only twenty five dollars a year to the Mystery Report program. I guess I'll take a stop and take a second here. And for those that are unaware, this is the Black Star section up here, and this is the Mystery Report. Just twenty five dollars a year. You're going to get all the newsletters, access to them through the Dropbox folder. Going back to 2019, when I was more active and the mystery report there's a breadcrumb trail laid down the videos have been moved over to this this uh, christian video channel otherwise everything would have just been lost so uh those and then those that want more after that you want the tutor program this this program here gives you access to the mystery explained you're going to get a free copy attached to your notification email the epub version that looks a whole bunch like 
Now this is uh, this is how you can get if you go to Amazon. But I did. Uh, where is it? Oh, here we go. Table of contents this is the EPUB version. I open it up with Adobe Digital Editions. It's free on the internet. And no, I don't want to be over here. My apologies. Uh, I hope you'll bear with me. I am just a little bit, or maybe a lot, off today. So uh, this is table of contents and everything that's going to be covered in the book. And images, 80 color-coded diagrams, helping you to see. This is like a manual. It's made to be read three times. And helps you to see the pattern of the three witnesses that's all around us. Again, some people see it. The minority of people see it. And once you see it, it's really a life-changing thing. So you get that attached to your notification email when you subscribe right here. That's what the cover looks like. You can also get the signed first edition author's copy. I believe it's number 80. It's been a while since anybody's wanted the autographed numbered version of the Mystery Explained. The, uh, if you're overseas, the extra is for the, for the customs and overseas postage. But uh, these are available. There's like 20 left in the first edition. Maybe those will be gone by the time the Black Star gets here. We'll see. But uh, if you go to Amazon.com, you can get a paperback version or you get a hard copy for, I think, $44 because they buy a lot of them. They get them cheaper than I can. Okay, so back over here. These are uh, my, just before you can see these dates, just before COVID, then the uh, the Tudor program subscribers had access to a chat room that we met in. I haven't been able to do that since. But, uh, and, and almost nobody wanted to say anything during these first meetings, but you can, you have access to them right here. I sure hope that these were moved from the, uh, the deleted channel, the one that YouTube got rid of. Okay. So, Ann, you wrote to me and you, you had mystery questions and answers. And then, there's a bonus down at the bottom because uh, Michael, you wrote to me and it's funny that I needed another article for uh, clarifying statements section. And as a matter of fact, a lot of those articles remain from from, from uh, the number three newsletter. There's a pattern to them that I left in there. So uh, let's just begin right here. And uh, this is a slightly edited version. And... Uh, what, uh, what I just sent to you and this morning. So she writes and she, she, um, I thank her for writing. And then this is what she writes. She says, good morning, Terrell. I hope you're having a good day so far. Not working too hard. I've been reading the mystery explained and I'm enjoying learning the differences between the church body and the gospel of the kingdom. So, and, uh, sometimes I can be an, I can appear to be nitpicking, but the the focus is on being, being accurate as possible. And so, whenever our choice of terms can get can be misleading, even for just two of us in a conversation, semantics is whenever I say gospel and you say gospel. If we're thinking two different things, then we're not going to be able to get to the, where we're trying to go. And so, you'll find me particularly. Uh, whenever you write me for the first time, second time, third time, that I spend a little bit of time defining things to, to ensure that we're all on the same page. And this this particular uh, response to Anne was written with you guys in mind also. So whenever I'm responding to you, the thing to realize also is that it's my answers are not just for you. Therefore, the babes that are in our midst that are looking over our shoulder, therefore, the, the intermediate members... And therefore, the advanced member. So there's some milk and there's some meat and kind of mixed in as I'm uh, trying to remove the semantics at the same time. So it's multitasking, kind of, and trying to answer your questions the best of my God-given ability. 
So I believe you mean the difference between the gospel of the grace of God, the word of the cross, for the mystery body of Christ, that's us, and the gospel of the kingdom, for the, the kingdom bride, Peter, John, and James. So I'll stop right here, and uh, Gary is uh, representing all of you guys that are going through the mystery explained, because I see him, he had to t take a uh, trip recently, but almost every Saturday, sometimes Fridays and Saturdays, and as we're working, then he uh, he's a studier, he's, he loves God's word like, like I do, and so he brings me these questions, and uh, he's he's been making comments about his maturity, because he's gone back, does a lot of writing, studying at night, like, you know, like I used to do. And uh, he's going back through his writings, and he's he's seeing what I've been telling him that he's maturing. And sometimes you don't realize it that you're really maturing. You're far more mature, far more developed than you were. I can see it, and I can tell by the by the structure of your questions. And uh, it's it's kind of like your kid, and uh, you know, three years old, and and ten years old, eighteen years old, the way that they're approaching questions. And you get as they develop more, and then your answers become more uh, detailed. And you know, like talking about sex with your 18 year old is going to be way different than with your three year old, right? And so that's kind of the way that my work is. It's uh, in the knowledge that some of us are babes, some of us are intermediate, some of us are, are more advanced. And Gary is likely the most advanced of anybody else, but he's had the most uh, one on one. You know, question and answer back and forth. We in many of the articles in the newsletters you'll see uh, for Gary, as over the years he's been asking, he's been asking the you know really good questions, and he's had uh, now benefit of uh, personal instruction. So he's uh and he's now from what I understand helping Nikki. So Nikki, you subscribed, and you have relocated here to the Ozarks, and you have Gary to be able to s send your questions, and he's uh. Whenever that type of relationship is uh, developing, then you see you're really giving Gary an opportunity. Gary, it's a great opportunity to help someone else, because God's only going to open so many doors for you as long as you're doing personal study by yourself. So whenever you, your heart, the desire in your heart grows to help somebody else, and they're asking questions and they're forcing you to go in God's Word and study and back and forth, God starts opening more doors. It's really an amazing thing. It's uh, the the work of tutors is what it is. We're going to continue this tutoring in heaven, and at the beginning of each age, the sons of God they strip stones off themselves and hand them to their brethren to have the opportunity for to be tutored for the entire age, so they can advance more at the end of the age. So um, develop developing your skills as a tutor on this side of the veil during this evil age. It's going to give you great rewards. It's going to give you insignias on your breastplate, your chest plate. And give you an opportunity to excel mightily in the ages to come. So I hope that uh, more and more of you will take advantage of the opportunity. So the uh, the differences, and, and what, what Gary has said to me, I don't know how many times, is that seeing the differences between the two Gospels of the New Testament was the big leap for him. And then the two churches and the four baptisms. And I can show you right here in the website. I mean, before you even subscribe, before you have anything, all you, you can watch all these videos for free. These this last two are from the lesson. It was during the time that YouTube canceled my channel and then gave it back to me. And... Um, these are 15 minute videos. These are the longer versions that are right here. But just start right here, the two Gospels of the New Testament. And then go to the two churches, the four baptisms. How many realize there are four distinct baptisms sent by God? Three are associated with the Gospel of the Kingdom. One's associated with our Gospel. Knowing the difference is really, really important. Then the difference between God, my Father, art in heaven. A lot of people have trouble. They think my Father, art in heaven, is the Almighty. And he's not. It sounds like sacrilege, doesn't it? it? Sounds like blasphemy or something. But it's the truth. My Father, who art in heaven, is the Spirit witness of the Word. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three witnesses of the Word. Three witnesses of the Almighty are in Revelation one eight. God who is, God who was, and God who is to come, the Almighty. 
there are three witnesses of spirit, blood, and water, just like my Father, uh, my Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But making the Son of God into the Almighty makes the Son of God into an idol. And that's what most of professing Christianity does. Most of professing Christianity are not Christians at all. They're members of the body of the Antichrist, and they don't even know it. The burning of the lake of fire as we speak, don't even know it. So very little is as it appears in your environment. Very little is as it appears. Almost everything is a lie. That's part of what this ministry is about. So come to terrell03.com and just watch these first six videos. See God's true Bible code. Spirit, blood, and water, that's what it's all about. And take advantage of the opportunity while you still can. Every day that the black star doesn't show up is one more day that you have time to prepare. Whether physically, guns, ammo, and food and water, which you still need to do some of that. Get your nano silver. Very, very important because you want to be around whenever we're called up. A whole, whole, whole pile of people are about to die. We want to be counted among the living. We want to have Elijah's insignia on us, never seeing death. It's going to be really important to you as we're going through the ages. We're distinct. We have markings on us that make us different from even other members of Christ's body. By being here at the end, whenever the black stars comes to terraform the planet, I'm going to get more into that in, if I ever get there, huh? <laughs> in uh, this presentation. So the differences between the gospel of the grace of God and the, and the gospel of the kingdom. The, this water gospel came first. The blood gospel came last. And the last was made first. Just like every blood witness in the Bible. Spirit comes first, then water, then blood. But the blood witness that's last is made first, which first in front of the water witness is what the spirit witness means when he says that. I've read most of the book and will be starting chapter 10 introduction to the blood witnesses of scripture so you've read about half the book almost half because there's a numerology to the mystery explain there are 20 chapters the second book was supposed to be chapter 21 but uh we're obviously going to be no need for that my expectations my hopes that there would be a large that god would call many many to come that there would be legions of sons of God helping others to see God's hidden wisdom just didn't, just didn't materialize. Or we, are, we are walking through the valley of shadow of death, literally. Darkness all around us. Very, very few are able to carry this light and to help others with it. So have you heard of... Oh, I have some questions and I hope that you can answer for me. Have you heard of people stating that there have been changes to the Bible and that this is done by Satan to deceive believers. So uh, before we go any further, the thing to realize is that Satan is an infinite realm singularity host, like God in his word, like you as a God in God's infinite realm. His three witnesses testifying right here, his 666 man is the devil, the beast, and the false prophet. Those are three witnesses of spirit, blood, and water, just like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Satan is our enemy from the infinite realm. Yes, as he's made reference to. But uh, in heaven, the almost infinite realm that contains this, this universe, he is the dragon. And the beast and the false prophet are their almost infinite realm hosts. They're frozen motionless from our perspective. We're frozen within a... a an instant of time. Heaven is almost in infinite. So they are, the, 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 the dragon's head was cut off pff, back in the days of Genesis. It still hasn't hit the ground. He's falling. His tail is moving across the sky of heaven and those, as those stars are falling, they're falling down to the earth and being incarnate. As the heavenly authorities in the heavens and as uh, Hillary and Obama and House of Rothschild and the bad guys the bad guys are all around us, some of them parading themselves as angels of light. They're evil. They're killers. And they have the appearance of angels. They're using God's word. They're quoting God's word. They're deceived themselves. They don't even know they're burning already in the lake of fire. The truth is stranger than fiction, much stranger than fiction. So, to answer your question here, 
then the answer is uh, there are copy errors in both sets of the major manuscripts. So what you have is an older set of Egyptian manuscripts. The Byzantine manuscripts are including those. Critical text is comprised, like the New American Standard. Some Bibles use the older Egyptian manuscripts. There are missing chapters, entire chapters that are missing. Mark chapter 16 is missing from the critical text. And uh, so then you have like the received text that is comprised of the Antiochian manuscripts. Antioch was the center of Paul's ministry. Mm -hmm. Many, many. That's where Luke worked. Paul worked. The uh, Peter, John, and James, you know, fishermen. And they would bring manuscripts. They would bring brand new papyrus. They had to fish and fish and fish, work and work and work and get brand new um, they wrote down their own uh, account of what happened in Aramaic. You realize Christ was speaking Aramaic and the fisherman's dialect of Aramaic, like the Galileans. And so if, if their testimony was going to become spread, to be spread, then it had to be translated. It had to be translated into the language of commerce at the time, which at that, that time was Greek. But Peter couldn't do that. Peter didn't speak Greek. But that's what Paul and that's what Luke, his physician, that's Luke, one of the smartest people of the, of, of the Bible, and likely a Gentile, by the way. Then uh, what he did was he, he would take Peter's account and then he, Peter had to bring him new papyrus. And then Luke would transcribe, he would translate, transcribe Peter's letters in, into what, you know, the way they appeared in Greek for circulation throughout the world, the known world at the time. So the manuscripts that you have that were sent to Egypt, they're the oldest ones. And those are the ones that I believe are going to be the most accurate, but they have copy errors. There's a percentage of copy errors in both sets of manuscripts. You have two major sets. That's the ones that I, I already described to you. They make up the receiving the critical text. Then you have the majority text. Majority text just means that they take all the manuscripts and they, they where they all agree, the majority, that's the majority text. So they tell you that whether it's critical, whether it's the older or newer, doesn't matter. Every single one of them is the same. So what, what I recommend is a, what I use the Nelson's Greek, English, and a linear Bible. It has all three of the text, if you count the major, the majority text as a text. All three of them, and then it shows you the forks in the road. That's what I'm looking at right now. That's what I use whenever I'm doing, when I'm doing my studies. So, uh, the, th there are translations. I recommend the New American Standard Bible, 1969, Lockman Foundation. Or the new King James Version is almost as good. You're using the received text rather than the critical text. And uh, then you realize that, like the New American Standard, has to borrow from the received text for the places like Mark 16. It doesn't appear. Right? So and there, if you look at the contents of that chapter, you'll see why. That the scholars just lost it because it doesn't look very good for Peter, John, and James. It shows that they have no faith, this and that. The other thing. Okay, so the, th the thing to realize here with this question is that God, the Almighty, has the ability to deliver the mail to his sons here on the earth. That we have the Holy Spirit within us to help us, to guide us. And in the old days, then I, I worked, not kidding you, concordances and original languages, dissecting, trisecting, word studies until 2005. And as God was showing me three witnesses of spirit, water and blood, and the lights came on, then I realized I don't have to dissect and trisect this anymore. God is showing me his wisdom through the three witnesses. Those three witnesses are testifying all the time. It's like angel song. It's testifying all the time. And once you can hear it, then you don't have to do all that. You don't have to do so the actual wording doesn't matter. It may not seem that way when you're beginning your, your journey, you're walking along. 
Well, that's my conclusion after just spending a lifetime. Now I'm in my 60s. Next, my birth, next birthday will be 65. God starting me, starting me on this trek when I was still less than 10 years old. My first miracles that I witnessed when I was around four or five years old. And I'm from a family of ministers, which is not can be a great thing. Kid doesn't necessarily mean good. There's many of my uncles and cousins that are blinded by nominationalism. So let's just say we had a lot of uh, interesting interactions at family reunions over what's going on. Some knockdown drag out sometimes. So uh, next question. Um, as we are the church body, so we are we are the body of Christ, and the Pauline epistles are meant for us. How are we to interpret the guidance from Paul for women who wear head coverings when praying, and women not speaking in church? Are these things that um, that we as the body should be observing today? It seems as though not being under the law that this is a form of works. Okay, so this is probably one of the most touchy subjects for uh, my sisters in Christ. And what does apply, what doesn't apply, every single word applies. That's uh, the Lord's commandment. I mean, um, I mean, we can stop right here, 1 Corinthians. You can just control. Yeah, let's allow this. Let's just go through and look. This will be the critical text version. The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves, just as the law also says. Say, Paul, he, he saw this coming. The Holy Spirit saw this coming. Because is this the law? Why are we supposed to obey the law? We're not under the law. We're under grace, right? But this is where Paul tells you, just as the law also says. So this is... What Paul is saying, remember that Paul is the steward of the dispensation of God's grace, like Moses is the steward over Israel, bringing down the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai. Paul is the steward. So a steward just means he's a slave, like Moses was a slave. He's a slave over, placed over all the other slaves. If you've ever been in a union, you know who the steward is. You call him the shop steward or whatever. I know being in the union. And he's elected by... The slaves, generally, we're the one that uh, says, we like this guy here. We want him to represent us. He does the speaking for us. Paul is the steward. God chose him. As a, as a, well, the Lord, uh, Lord God through Christ wrote to Damascus. He, that's where he called him the chosen instrument of mine. No other person in the Bible has ever been characterized as an instrument of mine other than the apostle Paul. I'm not saying that we worship Paul. Israel didn't worship Moses either. He's a steward. It's through Paul, that the revelations were given, and the word, and God's word was given, and this is the, according to the steward. Well, let's just keep on reading. This is what he's going to say. He says, if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God first went out, or has it come to you only? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. And if he, if anyone does not recognize this, then he is not recognized. So, members of Christ's body and professing Christians, particularly the, my sisters in Christ, do what they can to try to water this down and to infer that this is a law or this and that. And that is going to be to your loss. There are there's key things to understand here that's going to make everything make sense. And let's, let me just get back because we can go to First Timothy two. And uh, and you know other places the Apostle Paul, but these words right here the, to the Corinthian assembly probably the most important because it includes as the law also says and it includes the Lord's commandment. So yes, absolutely. Paul's statements in this area are characterized in the word of God as the Lord's commandment. And strict adherence will help sisters in Christ avoid a boatload of loss when we appear at the judgment seat where we receive heavenly rewards for good and bad deeds done in the flesh. They were not judged for sin. That's the settled at Calvary. 
God sealed us in His Son. When God looks at us, He sees His Son. And He sealed us for the day of redemption. And when Christ is revealed, we're going to be revealed with Him in glory. So we're seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. Ephesians 2, 34. That part's done. But now we're ambassadors sent from that heavenly position here to the earth to preach the gospel and to help our brethren to grow in Christ for the maturing of the body. Ephesians 4. All right, down to you, to you get the, the body of Christ in, in verse 15 and then the sword of the Spirit in verse 17. Well, I'm thinking uh, yeah, Ephesians 6 there with us anyway. The uh, We're all going to appear before the judgment seat. And what you do not want is to be, to suffer loss. We're going to stand there. We're going to put our works. Everybody's carrying works when this happens. We we dump our works right on the altar. Christ is on the other side. You're on this side. And you're expected to stand perfectly still, even leaning into it. And whenever he waves, he's going to wave over those works and it's going to, in a, in a flash of a moment, poof. It's going to be changed into rewards gold silver precious stones for the good stuff the bad stuff wood hay and straw first corinthians 3 start verse 6 well 10 through 12 so the bad works your garment's going to be become dingy it's going to become soiled it's going to become dark in the, in bad cases that's you're going to start off with a white, shiny garment that's going to be bright whenever you go to that judgment. Some of us are going to have bright garments whenever we return from that standing before before Christ. Some of us are not. And the pecking order for the next age is going to be determined at that judgment. Well, for us, I have to kind of, kind of clarify that a little bit. For the day of the Lord is coming up, there's going to be a jog, jostling around with members of Christ's body. At that time, you're going to realize 100% that you're in a competition with all of your brethren, and we should all be running to win. That's what I'm doing. Most of my members of Christ's body don't even realize they're in a race. But you will. And you're going to look around and see your brothers that have great crowns and big scepters and big jewels, chest plates, allow them to go everywhere. And you have this little bitty silver ring on your finger and no crown and dingy garments and things like that. And you're going to wish and wish and wish. Then you're going to come to your brother that has all these rewards. You're going to give him the little bit that you have so that he'll tutor you. So that at the next judgment, see, this is different. What's happening after we're taken, we're going to have a 3,600 year period where members of Christ's body, we're going to work with Elijah. He's on the earth. We're in heaven. We're restoring all things. So we're, there's an opportunity to excel for this little brief period coming up. Like you have a little brief period now to be able to excel up the pyramid, up higher and higher as members of Christ's body. Very, very few of you are taking advantage of the opportunity. But you will. Later, as the ages go by, and you're going to realize getting this darkness out of my garment is really hard. You don't have to work for it for, uh, for being a member of Christ's body, but you have to work for your position as a within the body. You want to be an eye, you want to be a foot. So there's many of the things that... Think of, the thing is about this world is that things are not as they appear, and those that think they saved are not. And most of members of Christ's body, that my brothers in Christ, they don't even know they're saved. So they're immature. They're like babes. Immature. So they start off and the pyramid, they're the bottom rungs of the pyramid. That's where the most stones are, but it's the most common stones. That's what the world is filled with right now. But the professing Christianity, most are not even members of Christ's body. They're they're in the lake of fire now and don't even know it. Okay, so we receive uh repeat these words slowly three times that Christ used to dispense kingdom doctrine to his disciples on earth as it is in heaven. Say it yourself. On earth as it is in heaven. That's really important. Things are happening on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. So then take the next step to realize that Christ's statements in this area are incomplete. Now, repeat the completed statement slowly three times. 
on earth as it is in heaven, as it is in God's infinite realm. Earth, Genesis 1-1, is the water witness, while heaven, Genesis 1-1, is the blood witness. And God, God's infinite realm, is the spirit witness in the only realm that is real. After all, heaven and earth of Genesis 1-1 are both created with a beginning and most certainly an end. Everything that has a beginning has an end. God has no beginning. God has no end. In his infinite realm, there's no such thing as time and space. There's no such thing as men or women or angels or any of this stuff. These are things that are of the earth that is temporal, temporary. From our perspective as gods in the infinite realm, everything that happens in the heaven and the earth takes place within the flash of an instant. Adam's dead from the Stanic Rebellion. Satan's dealt with. Adam stands up again with all the precious stones of Satan on his chest plate. And it all happens in a flash. But heaven and earth are created during that judgment process. And that's where we are right now. So from our perspective, looking back through the second veil, then the God's courtroom is open. The judgment is happening right now. And Adam is dead. He's about to be made alive again in that flash, but that's the thing about heaven and earth is they're temporal, they're time, they have created envelopes of time and space that are not even real. You're living in a matrix, inside of a matrix. The matrix is heaven. The matrix inside the matrix is earth. N neither of them are real. They look very real, don't they? But this is the way God does his judgment. There have to be many, many, many lives in many, many ages in order for God to complete the judgment of an infinite God. That's just the way that it works. That's why Paul makes mention of the ages to come, Ephesians 2.7, so that in the ages to come he can shed his grace upon us. Those of us that are called as first roots to be members of Christ's body, that's a special, very, very special thing. To judge the world and the angels, that is a very, very special thing. The inside of God's infinite, inside of time and space, he needs us to be hosts, to carry him. The incarnation of Christ is in me. The incarnation of God is in him, reconciling the world to himself. Second Corinthians 5, 19. And the almost infinite realm is incarnate inside of every member of Christ's body. And God is contained within that. The only thing that can contain God Almighty is God's word. Because God says so. That's what makes it great. Got a big old smile on my face just thinking about the glory of God. Okay. So. It's the only realm that's real. After all, heaven and earth are created. And I most certainly have an end. We are gods. We are. We're gods. Sons of the living God. The Almighty. Incarnate here on the earth as mere men for the purpose of judgment. Hebrews 9.27 one of the most important keys to remember always is that we are doing things already done. Ecclesiastes 1. On earth as is done in heaven and as done already in God's infinite realm. Let's take a good long look around to realize that you and everyone you know and everyone they know and everyone they know are all gods from God's infinite realm. And we know each other intimately from the inside out and everywhere in between. We go into, like Adam and Eve, one another and literally incarnate into each other. You go and read Paul's words to the body. He says that we are members of Christ's body and individually members of one another. We are in heaven too and in the infinite realm. And you have access to that, not by looking upwards and outwards into the God of this world or into heaven that's almost infinite and to the infinite realm beyond. You have access to those things by looking inwardly at Christ incarnate inside of you. The almost infinite heaven that contains this earth universe is incarnate inside of you. There's a face of Christ on that, and there are all your brothers' and sisters' faces on there too. That's how we access, we talk to one another, communicate inwardly where we're about to go. It's like a giant typewriter ball. That's also like a Rolodex. You can literally spin it and turn it and see your brother's faces and communicate back and forth. We always have constant communication with all of our brothers, at least those of us that are among the mature, those of us who understand and 
have developed the skills and know how to do these things, then once you move beyond the almost infinite realm, there's a Christ in you, there's a incarnate inside of you. You have the mind of Christ, then you look intently into God's face and you see the face of God Almighty incarnate inside of him. The cool part is, is that God incarnate inside of him is bigger. Doesn't make sense. But the infinite God contained by his word, whenever you can see his face and you can see the face of your God brothers that God made in his infinite realm, that's the only realm that's real. You can gain access to the members, your brethren, in God's infinite realm because the gods that are on the other side of that second veil are infinite. They can communicate within that split second, a moment of time. There's no such thing as time or space or anything like that exists in the infinite realm. We're individually members of one another. So whenever you're looking at the television, at the baseball games, and all the people full of the stadium, you know every single one of them intimately. We all know each other. We incarnate inside of each other. So each God seats all of his brethren within a great kingdom within himself and around a great table with some on his right the favored brethren go on your right side and the ones you don't like so much go on your left side the ones that tick you off you go oh really okay you're over here on the left and the ones that come along and help you and and you help them and you develop relationships you put them on your right side the manner in which we place our brethren inwardly determines our outward appearance and the way God and our brethren sees us in our places on the mountain of God where God has placed us as he desires all of this competition thing is because in the infinite realm we're gods and we're competing on the mountain of God we want to be the highest right next to God in the almost infinite realm the heaven we want to be the highest next to Christ with Paul Barnabas and Titus and those that walked the earth 2,000 years ago so as now, we're here at the end of the dispensation of God's grace, this household mystery time that the prophets could never see. And we're in a competition, and we're trying to move up the, the pyramid. I'm trying to help you to move up the pyramid. It's kind of like Amway. If you're young, maybe you don't even know what that means. But uh, sales, and then pyramiding, pyramid plans, going up ex going up and up and up and up and then you get members under you that you're helping and then that brings you up and that's the way it works and yes you are gods but you are incarnations Gary went through that real realization here just recently about he asked questions more about the infinite realm and things and so he was a little disappointed to find, to find out that yes you're a god you're still there though you are the incarnation of a god you incarnated inside of Adam and then at, he was murdered by Satan and Adam's brethren participated and so you the God that incarnated inside of Adam died on the day that Adam died so now God is playing Humpty Dumpty he, he made created the heaven which is the word incarnate and the earth which is Adam incarnate so that he can reconstruct all the members of Adam's body and put Humpty Adam back together again. The, the perfect Adam of Genesis 1-1, the earth, was created, but then it was made void. There were many ages, the ages of Genesis 1-1. The ages that came before us, as mentioned in Ephesians, I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes 1, 9-11, the ages that existed before us. The ages of Genesis 1-1. Everybody was perfect. Nobody was born. Everybody was created. There were no babies, no men, no women, nothing like that. Nothing like that even made sense. But all of it was made void because God had to reproduce, replicate, the destruction of the satanic rebellion that took place in the infinite realm. So people are under the misguided notion that the Big Bang created this uh, universe, but it didn't. There was a previously existing universe that was all one thing, and that was what it was made formless and void. The Big Bang was the destruction of a previously existing universe. So the remnant remains have been reconstituted. God is doing his work in Genesis 1, 
of reconstitution. Remaking the current universe out of what was broken. That's where we are now. So, uh, therefore, if you're following then, yes, you are gods, but incarnations of gods standing in judgment in God's infinite realm for active participation in the satanic rebellion. You're actively participating as a perpetrator or a victim. So some of us have lives that we're never going to mount to very much in this world. We're going to be held down, pushed down. God of this world's got his boot on our necks. We're not going to go anywhere. It's the next where we're about to go, where we're, we're glorious, where we judge the world and the angels. Not here. Those that are getting their reward here, <laughs> they're getting it here. Because they have another destiny where we're about to go. Everything's going to be flipped over. Those that you believe, many of you, that you believe, the Mike Adams, good, perfect example. Somebody that has access to millions of dollars and access to be able to help a lot. He could have underground arc cities and everything. Instead, he's playing controlled resistance. He's, he's, he appears to be one thing, but he's going to be turned out to be something else. Enough said. So this is obviously a long story. The keys are that some among us, those incarnate here as women, were deceived by Satan into deceiving other gods and going out to deceive using every form of trickery imaginable. Those incarnate here as men were not deceived. That's where 1 Timothy 2 comes right in. It was a woman that was deceived and fell into transgression. But the man was not deceived. So those are all types. Those incarnate here as women were those that were deceived by Satan in the infinite realm. Those that incarnate here as men were not deceived by were not deceived by Satan. They laughed at Satan. Satan could not deceive them. It was impossible. But <laughs> those that Satan deceived that are incarnate here as women, they went out and deceived those incarnate here as men. So what you're ha what's happening right now is that women are put together deliberately and on purpose with those that they deceived in God's infinite realm. So when you look at it from that perspective, then you're going to realize that everything Paul says about remaining silent, being in submission, make perfect sense. Because we are doing things on this earth that have already been done in heaven, that have already been done in the infinite realm. That's where the deception took place. By subjecting yourself as the lady and receiving instruction with complete submissiveness, that and remaining silent is an important part because then you're not going to regurgitate what's already been done. The deception, the beguiling and the deception that Satan did, that the serpent did to Eve, that's what's playing out again through the lips of the woman that deceived the man. So you want to break that chain? That's what Paul's saying. That's what he's saying. In uh, what was the first Corinthians is it 11? When, and that reference I did not answer. I realized that later when I was praying about it, and that uh, you asked about the veil. So l l let me just stop here for a second. I'll go get that and and, and give you an ex explanation. Okay, so we can just start right here. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head, but every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for it is one. And the same as a woman who has her head shaved. Okay, so and if you, when you continue going down, it talks about how man is the image and glory of God because he's a spirit witness. And woman is the image of man because man in his relationship to God is a water witness. Woman in her relationship to man is a water witness. She's a helper. Like the Holy Spirit is a helper for the Father and the Son. She's in a helper position. That's what she's supposed to do. When she tries to be the head, when she tries to be the man, then, or when the man abdicates, whenever he does not want to be the man, he wants to be the woman, he wants to be led around, that's just as bad in the eyes of the Almighty. It's not as bad in the eyes of the world, particularly right now. You see the reversal roles that are that's happening right now. So when you get down to uh, verse this is, I think, what you're referring to. Therefore, the woman should have a symbol of authority over her head because of the angels. 
probably one of the most misunderstood verses of the Bible. Why does a woman wear something over her head when she's praying because of the angels? The angels are a spirit witness over the man. So you take, which you can kind of understand, you take Eve out of the side of the man and stand her by his side. I reported on that just recently, but not in these videos. That's how she became his helper. The perfect number is nine. Everybody believes it's seven, but it's not. It's nine. You have to take the woman and put her back inside the man. That puts three witnesses of spirit, blood, and water back inside of him, and also making the sign of the cross. The complete man. But then you got to take that complete man, the number nine, three above chakras, power centers, three below chakras, and the three laying sideways in the middle, making the cross. You have to take that immortal soul and put it back inside the angel. So the symbol of authority over a woman's head, we'll do that. The symbol of authority over me, that, that's a veil. There's a first veil and a second veil. There's a veil that separates your, your physical body from your soul. There's a second veil that, that separates your soul from your spirit. The same two veils of the tabernacle of Moses in the temple, the same two veils that are in the Bible, are inside of you. They're inside your family. That's what I'm saying. When you see the three witnesses, you're going to see them everywhere. That symbol of authority a woman wears is the symbol of the veil that's between the earth and heaven. It's saying, I acknowledge myself as a water witness. But don't feel bad. The Holy Spirit is a water witness. You've heard of the power of the Holy Spirit. There's also a power of the woman too. But the Holy Spirit knows it is not my Father who art in heaven. The Holy Spirit knows it is not the Son. It's the physical manifestation of. It's the helper. That's what Christ called the Holy Spirit. The helper that I'm going to send to you. The Helper has its own ministry, the Holy Spirit, in preaching the gospel of the kingdom. First, God and my Father who art in heaven sent John the Baptist. The Spirit witness came first. Then, Jesus Christ comes as the Son of God, but then he left and sent the Holy Spirit at Pentecost to the twelve. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. It was rejected, but you can see a well-defined ministry of the Holy Spirit. Women have the same thing. It's just, you, there are many things to realize. There are things that you can do right and being obedient. And there are things that you can absolutely do wrong and moving beyond the veil, which is a symbol of what? Authority. Just like it says here. You're a water witness and you're going to behave like a water witness. You're going to subject yourself just like the body subjects itself to the spirit. What happens when the body tries to subject its will over the spirit? Bad things happen. So, this is not uh, a, a uh, male chauvinist thing or anything like that. People want to make Paul into a chauvinist or make me into a chauvinist. I see these things by the Spirit and can draw the diagrams. And I've seen these things since I was a kid. And now I'm old. I see it and I can share it with you. I can tell you there's no malice or anything to do with that. It has to do with things that have already been done. And women were deceived in the infinite realm by the devil, by Satan in the infinite realm, the devil here. And whenever they do not keep that symbol of authority, they don't subject themselves, when they don't remain silent, they are doing the devil's work like they've already done. So the, the, there's sanctity in the childbearing, and that's First Timothy 2. I'm not pulling up all these verses, but First Timothy 2, start about 11. Just keep reading. And in the knowledge that you gain from this presentation, that all of this tracks back to the infinite realm, where you are a God, and you're there now. You that's here, part of this judgment, are an incarnation of a God. Okay. And back over here. Um, somehow or no, I must have clicked the page. My apologies. Okay, uh, take a good look around. We did that. Obviously a long story. And this is about where it was. So the men that are here, they're gods. They were not deceived. They're by Satan. They're deceived by those that are kind of here as women. So just take a look around. The, the men, the women in your life, you know them. They know you. And you're doing things already done. Part of the Rebellion. 
And then women, take a look around. Do you know these guys? They're around you. And you know the other women in your life. I mean, it goes, you know people on the other side of the planet intimately, much less those that are in your environment that you're interacting with, and as your children, and as your father, and as your, we all know each other. And we have, we're, we're playing out and doing things already done. Some of us are on the right path. We're in observance. We're keeping, we're in keeping with the Lord's commandment, the Lord's commandment through the Apostle Paul. Some of us are not. Some of us are being reckless and making things worse. And we will be saved, but as through fire, some of us that uh, are not able to connect the dots, those of us who rebel, you listen to me right now, you're going, this guy's full of himself. And then you take steps in the opposite direction, it's only going to hurt you in the end. It's not going to hurt me one bit. I can see these things. But women, um, unable to resist the natural urge to speak up and provide instruction in the assembly will inevitably perpetuate the same mistakes on earth as is in heaven, as is in God's infinite realm. So once you grow spiritually to see the three realms as one, then Paul command, Paul's uh, commands and teachings for situations like this all make perfect sense. They all make perfect sense. In the last days, when the um, this is Anne's question. In the last days, when the church body has been taken up to heaven and Elijah has returned, all believers will have a part in the gospel of the kingdom and observe Jewish law. Question. So. This is where semantics can hurt us because believers. The answer to your question is yes, but the believers are those that obey the gospel of the kingdom. There's going to be no more gospel of the grace of God on this planet. Nobody's going to be able to preach the gospel of the grace of God because all the preachers are going to be raptured. Think about it. God must send the preacher. The preacher has the Holy Spirit within him. The preacher preaches the gospel and the hearer obeys and responds, and the Holy Spirit hands him the faith of Jesus. It's all described in the mystery explained. Hands him the faith of Jesus so that he can then believe. That's the gift of God, the faith of Jesus. That's the seed that becomes New Jerusalem inside of you. The incarnation of the almost infinite realm. It starts off like a little baby in a manger in your heart. That's the gospel is the power of God Almighty. The gospel, not God's forbearance, not his predestination, not anything else other than the gospel is the power of God. Why? Because that's God's word and that's what God says so. God says so. That's it. The, some people think that God can do anything. God cannot do anything. Sounds like blasphemy, doesn't it? The reason he can't is because he gave his word. God must keep his word. Once God says it's going to happen like this and then this and then this, it must happen that way. The thing that happens last cannot happen first because God said so. So there are things that are not possible. I know, it sounds like blasphemy, but that's what it is. God binds himself by his word. God's word is laid out in the same pattern as the tabernacle of Moses in the temple, having three witnesses of spirit, blood, and water. 100% absolute truth. Most people don't have any idea what any of this means. It's holy of holies, the holy place, the court. There are veils. This is a man. When you look down on the temple, David's temple, it looks just like a man. It even has two sidewalks and five fingers that branch out. It looks just exactly like a man when you look at it from above. And this is the, the, the veils, and there are patterns. There's a, a water washings out here in the water section. There's anointings that you have to have with oil before you can go back here. Water, blood, the blood of the animal, the altar of incense, the brazen altar, the smoke that goes up so you can pass through the veil. Once you understand these things, that this is a person, you're going to realize that this is the blueprint of New Jerusalem. This is the new blueprint of heaven. This is the blueprint of God's infinite realm, heaven and the earth. Three witnesses. They're everywhere. It's laid out, and this is uh, the Old Testament, 39 books. The Kingdom New Testament, 13 books. Paul's Epistles, 13 books. One book is different. Book of Acts. That's this veil. It's a veil book. Even if you look at the veil, you see blue and red on the opposite sides. God has everything laid out. It's all testifying all the time. 
once you understand the symbolism and God's word is alive in your heart, then you can scan back and forth in the Old Testament, Pauline Epistles, Kingdom, New Testament, back and forth. See, this is prophecy unclothed, this is prophecy, prophecy clothed. And then you can look inwardly and see that this thing is alive inside of you. God's written word is the only living document in existence. It's testifying, using angel song all the time for those with ear, the spiritual ears to hear. We're moving through this. This is the timeline. We're moving through this blue period right now. The mystery. Uh, as I was saying in one of my recent reports, no prophecy has been fulfilled for 2,000 years. People think I'm nuts. It, this is, we're moving through this, this period right here, this disposition of God's grace. It's not, it's not in the Old Testament. There's nothing in the Old Testament about God's sons judging the world and the angels or seating the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. These are all this, all these things, our gospel, our church, our translation, immortality, all according to the revelation of the mystery. Prophecy is fulfilled over here in the day of the Lord. The mystery is revealed. And that's my book, The Mystery Explained. And the, the revelation of the mystery. Because the Lord God, for some reason, picked me to see this stuff, and I see it, and I'd share it with you guys. The timeline shows the dispensation of God's grace. It's a mystery period, actually. The dispensation of God's grace contained the, uh, a dispensation is not a time or an epoch. It is a household. So this is a mystery time that we're moving through right now. As soon as the rapture happens, the prophetic period is going to kick off again. And what was happening here is going to start happening here. This part right here is going to be gone. We're going to be seated in heavenly places. The devils and his minions are going to be chained. We're going to be in heaven, pulling the levers, doing in heaven what Elijah's doing on the earth. So, and that's uh, until the devil and his minions are going to be chained, and then they're going to be released at the end of the age for their short time. We'll see all that from heaven before we come back with the Lord in great glory. Colossians 1 verse 4. So, any person, whether they are Indian, Asian, or other culture, will have to convert to Judaism to be able to participate in New Jerusalem? Hmm. We need to slow down and understand the differences between six-day people and seventh-day people. With a, and there are more people than that. But with a part in Adam's recent incarnation, so you and me, we have a part in Adam's recent incarnation whenever Adam and Eve were put in skins in Genesis 3.21. Everything happening before that, from Genesis 2.7 to Genesis 3.1, took place in heaven. Very near the center of the throne. Where the Lamb of God is in Revelation 7:17. So they, whenever Adam and Eve were cast down, they were cast, they were cast from the heavenly garden to the earthly garden, and they were put in skins. Notice there's no begetting, there's no Cain and Abel or anything until Genesis 4, after they are put on the earth in these skins. Genesis 3:21. People think those are just human skins, but I mean, they think they're animal skins. They're human skins. Then Elijah, he has, he's in animal skins, and he has, he has with a leather belt. John the Baptist, animal skins, leather belt. There's a symbolism there. And I'm gonna, I'll share that here in a bit. These types. Okay, there are differences. We have a part in Adam's recent incarnation. There are six day people. The, uh, those that ha are RH positive exclusive, those races like Chinese, all the Oriental races, RH positive exclusive. You go to China and you have negative blood, you could be in trouble. 99 point big percentage of all Oriental people RH positive. They all have straight black hair too. Beardless. Aborigine people. Pretty much the same way, there are exceptions to all of these rules because when Seventh-day people, they intermarry with Sixth-day people, then you get the patchy beard and you get this and that and the other thing. Because that happened whenever God made Adam in the infinite realm, God made members of his body. Those are the Sixth-day people. 
That's who the six-day people represent. The gods like Adam then incarnated inside of Adam and Adam incarnated inside of them too. And then some of those gods interacted with the, the natives, if you will, the inhabitants of the land, the members of Adam's body. So the American Indians, for example, beardless, straight black hair. They are relatives or cousins with the, the Indian races. The, uh, I'm talking about India and why they were confused as Indians in the first place, Christopher Columbus and others. But they are relatives of the, of the Oriental races and they're six day people. They've been here for hundreds of thousands and millions of years. They evolved from the waters of Genesis 120. So the truth is, people want to argue about evolution or creation. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news. Or good news, depending. But evolution and creation are both real. Evolution has been taking place for a long, 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 long time. The creation part, Genesis 3.21, only happened about 12,500 years ago. At, with the deluge from the black star the destruction that came and the aftermath. Kind of similar to what's about to happen now with the day of the Lord. So this is an explanation. I see I'm, I'm, I'm an hour six now. So uh, they're connected. The thing to realize this is the, the you know, the high points. Beardless races, races RH positive exclusive. And uh, they're connected spiritually to heaven of Genesis 1-8. That's heaven of this universe. Seventh-day people from Adam and Eve's recent incarnation, they are connected to heaven of Genesis 1-1, the highest heaven. That's First uh, Kings chapter 8, start at verse 26. Both David and Solomon, very familiar with the heaven and the highest heaven. And if you just go look in your Bible, heaven is heaven of Genesis 1-8. It's begotten from the waters above and waters below. But then there's heaven of Genesis 1-1. That's the highest heaven. And all, it's all in my diagrams. I'll be able to show you. So those among us preaching the word of God, the word of the cross gospel message to six day people are making gross errors and doing the devil's work. In complete and utter ignorance. I'm going to go to China and I'm going to preach the gospel. Well, you don't even know what you're talking about. God didn't call six day people to be members of Christ's body. They're not going to judge the world and the angels. They have, they incarnate over and over and over again within any age. Seventh-day people are the ones that incarnate once per age. Hebrews 9.27 is a dispensational truth. And most professing Bible experts, they don't know the difference between truth, eternal truth, and dispensational truth. That's true for a particular household. They don't know the difference. So they mix, mismatch, they mash it all together and create one giant dispensation. Or they have Israel and then a New Testament. Jesus Christ's ministry is of water and blood. Not water only, water and blood. Three that testify. Spirit, water and blood. And the three are into the one. That is from the critical text, First John chapter 5, um, 7 and 8. But most professing Christians, they think that there's only one ministry of Jesus Christ. They take the water and the blood, they mix it all together. Instead of the gospel of the kingdom for Peter, and the word of the cross for Paul, and the, the bride and the body, the four baptisms, they just mash it all together. That's what denominationalism does. And that's of the devil. And that's what's being sold as Christianity today. Most of you, that's what you're exposed to. So you're living in a matrix, Neo. And I'm trying to give you the red pill. Most people are going, nope, I think the steak tastes just fine. I want to have the steak and I want to have the blue pill. Thank you very much. I'd rather wake up in my bed believing whatever I want to believe. That's pretty much the way that it is. They don't want to wake up. They don't want to see the tr be the truth. As soon as they see the truth, then they start preaching the difference, the, the word of the cross, rather than mixing everything together. They start, te they start teaching grace doctrine to members of Christ's body. That you're going to become the devil. You're going to become the heretic of all those blinded by denominationalism. You're no longer going to be popular. You're going to be like me. You're going to be banned. People, uh, I'm going to be, you're going to be less popular in this world. I just, for those uh, Garys, you know, the Garys that are out there and the Davids and those of you that are in, in Anne 
and Michael that's coming up. I'll show you a little bit of what he wrote. Then, um, yeah, we're going to ride in the back of the bus. I have a big grin on my face. I'm happy to ride on the back of the bus because as soon as, we're going to go through that veil and everything's going to change and we're going to be in great glory. And those that have been in, in, in you know, getting their reward are all of a sudden going to be <laughs> bobbing up and down the lake of fire where they are now. They just don't know it yet. So, uh, you realize the vast differences between the sixth day people and the seventh day people. The door will open for you to see that the amphibian and the reptile races, they're piloting the chariots of fire. They're also members of Adam's body. Silicon based life forms. There's myriads and myriads of different kinds of life forms. Not just carbon based, not just silicon based. So you wonder, I'm you know, give you statements about silicon based life form and the carbon silicon hybrid that's in the biological weapon and things like that. Some of that info comes from the mind of Christ and knowing about all these things that have been taking place for millions and millions and millions of years. Well, you can't really put your finger on it. I mean, think about it, ladies. You can't even put your finger on the, the uh, intuition that you have. You, you have a massive amount of control over the information flowing in an intuition realm. An entire realm you have access to, men do not. So when you start to sit down and say, well, and men are looking at you sideways, going, whoa, where would you get that from? It's intuition. You can't hardly explain it. Well, the spirit is even more powerful. Things come by the spirit that's far beyond intuition. And whenever you can see those things by the spirit, you start trying to explain to everybody what's going on. You're going to think you're like John the Baptist. They're going to think you have a demon. That's what they think. But that's okay. Just uh, stay in the back of the bus and we're going to get there. But then the, the, the key thing that Christ says is that wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Vindication is coming. And the wisdom is the fruit part that the sons of God develop over time. And then they look back over the words and everything that we say and utter and think. Even the secrets of man are judged. Oh, if everything's going to be made into light and then everybody's going to go back and realize, holy cow, that tarot guy was right, wasn't he? And almost nobody believed him. So then uh, she thanks me very much. I didn't uh, quite get into everything. But uh, newsletter subscribers, this is going to be uploaded to the 2022 Miss Report. And you can have access to all this. Then uh, you're very welcome connecting the dots. If you are connecting the dots in your intuition, deep inside may help you to see that we have had this and similar conversations already on a wide range of topics. The truth is indeed greater than fiction. And most everything will make perfect sense once we pass through the other side of the veil, approaching veil. Then this one I'm just going to go through quickly. May add a diagram, may not. If, uh, my strength is coming back to me. I, the discovery was made of what the, my problem has been. And it started over three years ago. But I'm not out of the woods yet. Um, extraterrestrials, the races, God's word, and the Almighty. This was written by this morning. Um... You were up early, weren't you, Michael? 4.07 a.m. You sent this. Then uh, you were listening and you wrote. Um, after listening to your show, oh, after your show recently, this should be indented, my apologies. You espoused that extraterrestrials of various races have visited and taken residence here on Earth for millions of years. I don't doubt that How, uh, whatsoever. Uh, as well, it uh, wasn't my first reference it wasn't the first reference that you made, speaking of Elijah. No, I, I bring this stuff up to kind of, you know, chime in and kind of uh, make you guys aware of my background that are kind of new. That uh, really, the mystery explained God's word. This is where my heart is. There's the 9-11 investigation and then the Black Star investigation, all these others there. God sent me to, like on a mission. To find out what the truth was, is and help other people. But this is where my heart is. These things. Okay, so uh, Elijah having been taken away in the chariot of fire, no doubt. He's talking about Second Kings chapter two, starting at verse ten. Uh, my question, um, as these references you've made, Elijah being a man of God, um, whom will return with great power. Are you implying in some fashion that 
God Almighty is an extraterrestrial. And I really laughed out loud whenever you asked me that. No, not at all. Amphibian and reptilian races did not simply come into our planet to visit. These races have been here from the beginning and evolved from the waters of Genesis 1 to 20. Adam and Eve are the father and mother of all the races of the universe. And the Almighty is the one and the only one and true God. His Son is the Word incarnate in heaven of this universe as the Lamb of God is in the center of the throne who incarnated onto this planet of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, making intercession for us right now as we speak. The Almighty is infinite. That's why nobody's seen uh, John 1, 18. Nobody's seen God at any time. It's impossible. He's infinite. He interacts with heavenly and earthly finite hosts at, uh, via his three witnesses of spirit, blood, and water. That's God to come, God who was, God who is. God who is testifies as an eagle. All seeing sees everything. God who was the bullock, past. The lion is God to come, the prophet. God who was is the priest. It's like Moses. It's like Elijah and Moses on either side of Christ. Same symbolism. So then he says, uh, "Oh, it's the uh, so spirit, water, and blood um, in the same pattern as the Word testifies, as my Father art in heaven, the Son and the Holy Spirit." The earth testifies as the heavens, heaven, and earth. You testify through your spirit, your soul, and your body. The family testifies through the man, the woman, and the children, the seed that grow up to become either the man or the woman. And you can see in our environment, on Fox News, everywhere, this transgender crap, pardon my language, that's out there that's trying to defile God and his word. That's that's what what it's all about. It's a spiritual warfare taking place all around us. So of course we receded Genesis three. Fifteen, your seed, of the of the serpent and the devil and her seed, being descendants and participants of Adam and Eve's recent incarnation Genesis three twenty one. Amphibian races are followed by the reptilian races and then mammalian races that dominate the world today. Older races are God's custodians all around us, ant anticipating Elijah's arrival with the inbound black star that is about to terraform the planet. See, Elijah told the, the sons from space that these things were coming, and so they're ready. They're supposed to be keeping in hiding, but they, were, they're, they, were, they have the temperament of children, really. And like children, sometimes they get afraid and they do things they shouldn't do. Six-day people include Oriental races, the Aboriginal races, naked natives in the jungles, American Indians, so on and so forth. Then, uh, Michael, there is no doubt whatsoever that uh, the human being is incredible, amazing, complete, complex feat of engineering. And all life systems created for all dependents. Phenomenal, magical spark of conception through complexities and creating another human being. Inside the woman is nothing short of wonder and behold. Oh, but is this the work of a single extraterrestrial? And the answer is most certainly not. No, silly. The older amphibian and reptilian races are as terrestrial as the mammalian races. So if you notice, if you're keeping up with the movement of the spaceships and things, they defy gravity and they're silent. And they go through the atmosphere, they go through space, and they go right down into the water and they disappear because there are civilizations that are under there that are beyond our watch, but they are, they've been instructed by Elijah and skins before that about what's happening. And they know what's happening. They know the black star is coming. They know they have to clean up the mess, the nuclear power plants, so on and so forth. They've got to clean it up. They're going to be working. So when Elijah gets here, everything's going to make perfect sense to them. We're going to see that from heaven. The Holy Spirit's working with the body of Christ. He's got to deliver us and then come back and start his kingdom ministry. He can't do both. He does one, finishes that, the rapture happens, we're delivered, and then phew, he comes back. Elijah's standing on the banks of the Jordan River, just like John the Baptist, and off they go with the gospel of the kingdom. Just like the body of Christ never even was on the planet. So a lot of our evidence that's here is going to be, the earth's about to be terraformed, and a lot of that is about to be wiped out, removed. The kingdom period is going to begin, and those hosts are going to have the Holy Spirit and the most of the people walking around during the day of the Lord are going to be raised from the dead. 
not just Elijah is going to raise the dead. Elijah is going to baptize his disciples on the banks of the Jordan River. And he's going to command them to go to their graves and to raise their fathers. They're going to be raised and they're going to come and they're going to be baptized. It's going to be a giant millions and millions and millions. And then it, he's going to turn around, smack the banks of the Jordan River, and they're all going to walk across the Jordan River. They're going to take 12 stones and they're going to stack them as an altar, five, four, and three. And he's going to stand on them and he's going to raise his hand. Everybody's going to listen to what he says. And during his speech, eyes are going to be opened up and the sons of God that are in the sons of Israel, they're going to realize that he's David, that he's Abraham, that he's the deliverer, that he's Joshua. They're going to realize that what's going on is He's their father, Adam. And then the sons from space and the cleaning up of everything and the greatest kingdom on earth that's ever been is going to be all the way from the Nile River to the Euphrates River. And it's, it's going to be the strongest thing for over 3,000 years till the black star comes near the end of the age. The devil's going to have a short time and things are going to get really crazy. We'll see all that from heaven. So that's kind of what I'm talking about here. But uh, let's see, Elijah will be in the process of restoring all things when Israel and everyone else wakes up to realize that he's King David, that he's Abraham, that he's John the Baptist, the priest, he's prophet, priest, and king. He's Joshua, the deliverer, because all are skins of Adam, the son of God. See, there's only two sons of God in the Bible, two. There's one from heaven, there's one of the earth. One from heaven, one from the earth. The one from heaven made the one from the earth. And he made him in the garden to be the prophet, priest, and king of the entire universe. Just like he is the prophet, priest, and king of the entire heaven on earth as it is in heaven. First Adam, last Adam. But they're all Adam. That's the thing to realize. By the time we get to the ages of the ages, everybody's going to realize that. Think things through carefully to realize there is only one God. There is only one Lord And son of God with a big ass in heaven, the prophet, priest, and king of heaven. There's also one son of God of earth with a little s, created by God through the son of God the, to be prophet, Elijah, priest, John the Baptist, and king David of the earth, and his name is Adam. After all, everyone else is adopted as sons. Paul says it over and over again. Everybody else is adopted, but the two that are not adopted, that are sons of God, they're called out as sons of God. In God's word is Jesus Christ. And he's called out by John the Baptist, Elijah, David, Abraham. That's the same David that said you are God's that Christ is quoting in John 10. Start at verse 34. So there's a method to God's seeming madness in his word. Jesus Christ keeps testifying about the the one, the prophet that's greater than a prophet, the one that belongs in kings' palaces, the one that's greatest born among women. Who's the greatest born among women? Some people think it's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ disagrees with you. The greatest born of women is, Jesus, is John the Baptist. You know why? Because he's just another skin for Adam. Who's greater than Adam? The first man. He's the greatest in the earth. Jesus Christ. The Son of God, the Son of Man. He's the greatest in heaven. And that's the way it is. In the beginning, God created the heaven. That's Christ. And the earth, that's Adam. And that's all there is. Everybody else is a member of their bodies. The competition here in the earth is to do what we can to be to win the race, to be the, the highest in the pyramid in heaven and in the mountain of God in God's infinite realm. That's what it's all about. So how... Oh, the, the, the bottom line here is that everybody... That's the elder, amphibian, reptilian races, the so-called ETs, six-day people, seventh-day people, including the Arabs, the Jews, everybody. They're all waiting for somebody. Notice that? They're all waiting for the same chosen one. That's God's word. That's identified in Scripture as Elijah. But he's really the father of us all. So how do you define the Almighty? The Almighty is the God and Father and Creator of the King of, and King of God's infinite realm, where you are God's. And uh, if you understand the words of David, the Son of God, and Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who formed him from the garden, in, in the garden, in Genesis 2, kind of a lot in that sentence. 
God called heaven and earth into existence by his word for the purpose of judgment for all gods actively participating in the satanic rebellion that took place long before God's infinite realm. Um, long before, in God's infinite realm, long before heaven and earth were ever created. Now the um, Elijah chariot references coupled with the stated extraterrestrial visitation for millions of years have me seeking clarifying uh, clarification of their relationships to each other. It's, it's easy to, to formulate the hypothesis using the evidence that uh, the older races are coming from somewhere else, but they're from here. Hold on a little longer, brother, because soon we stand together in great glory, glory looking down on the toys of this life as a mere dream. Then these are, uh, if you go through the newsletter, there's um, information that was already there in the previous newsletter, and the COVID section has been updated to uh, for the mystery, because some, some subscribers are just Mystery Report subscribers, so not, uh, not Black Star subscribers. So that's, uh, see if there's anything else I don't want to show you here. This is the 9-11 truth. Oh, whenever you, uh, this is the way you can access. Also pulled up, what am I going to show you first? This is the 9-11 book. If you go to chapter 11, I don't know if I can just find it. Chapter 11, then there's a, uh, this is about FBI agent Chris Combs. That's a, that's a bad man right there. There's the hole that was punched out by the submunition sub bomblet number three. This is the death corridor right here. Behind number six column is where April Gallup, I interviewed her. That's where she was seated. And here it is, chapter 11. The, uh, the top 100 9 11 events. These are the events. And the, these links, many of them are going to be. Uh, here's Alan Wallace's testimony right there. All kinds of diagrams and links and the most important events. It's, uh, it's worth getting your nano silver if you're a non subscriber. You don't want to be a subscriber, that's fine. But this is, uh, this is what you get. Let me see if I can pull up this page. This is the. Uh, Whenever you purchase your nano silver, then this is all the files that you get. So the mystery explained is part of that. The 911 book is part of that. This is um, the using nano silver in the, in the aerosol form, right here. Nanoparticles. Doug put this together. The eight pages. The extra weight chart. John's one page. You get all these files. Whenever it's just the mystery explained is worth more than the nano silver that you get and all the other files that you get. Whenever you go to terrell03.com and order, I would, of course, recommend that you just become a subscriber. Why pay the extra fifteen dollars for shipping when, add ten bucks to it, you get, you get a subscription and you get access to the Dropbox folder. You can go back to the beginning. 2019 is newsletter number one, and there's a video that's connected to that and a newsletter, and you can go to newsletter number two, three, four, five, all the way up to 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022. It's it's worth far more than the price of admission. Then this, uh, whenever you subscribe, then this is the 423-page uh, version of the Mystery Explained. This is the actually the longer version. So if this thing was going to cost like $100 to publish if I didn't shorten it. I had to edit it. So what you get with the EPUB version is the edited version. The full version is the PDF version. And it's... It uh, needs, I mean, it's it's still in rough draft form. Uh, so there's a boo-boo here and there everywhere. I mean, not everywhere, but this is uh, whenever it was actually completed. It was October 25th, 2005. So that's uh, that's my report. Then before, we, before I let you go, then I had pulled up these diagrams for the Mystery Explained. It starts off like this. Is the key. God created the heaven and the earth. God, Christ, Adam. And then those three witnesses are broken down into these three witnesses. This is the same pattern as the tabernacle. If you can see it, see it? Tabernacle. This is what we should see. This is what we actually see. This is what we should see until the Reformation, the way Scripture refers to it. And what we actually see is two different things. Now this is uh, 
Gary makes reference to his red folder. This is uh, God's Word. And then the red folder that you develop in between, that's the one that continues to grow. And then my book, The Mystery Explained, is... Um, here it is. God's Word, Spirit. My, my Mystery Explained is the Water Witness Helper. And then what you build in between, if, you've, if the Mystery Explained is a manual. And you will, if you do follow the instructions and draw the diagrams, actually draw them with your hand, God's going to show it to you. This is the beginning to the end, beginning, the end, and what's in between. And this is on the back cover of the Mystery Explained. And this is uh, God who was, God who is, God who was to come, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all the three witnesses right down to Christ in you. And then, I pulled up multiples. Oh yeah, this is showing how scripture is like a, uh, scripture is laid out as just like the temple. Which some people, you know, they put some of these things together. And there was one of these that I was going to show you that I made a mental note that I don't see it yet. That Oh, here it is right here. This is the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, John, and James. Moses, Christ, and Elijah. Three witnesses of spirit, blood, and water. And whenever you wake up and realize the three witnesses, you'll realize that Christ is the Lord God who made Adam and Eve. Adam, spirit, Elijah, Moses, water. Noah and Moses are skins for your mother Eve. I know, sounds crazy. Sounds crazy. Didn't think that up in a day. Since my since my childhood, God's been showing me all these things. This is uh, the infinite realm. This is where we come from. This is heaven, almost infinite realm. New Jerusalem is handed down from this realm down to here by Almighty God. There's three witnesses of spirit, blood, and water. There's the body of Christ. There's the body of Moses. Peter, John, and James are on the sea of glass. Right here, we are in the Lamb in the center of the throne. We judge the world. And we judge the angels. 1 Corinthians 6, 2, and 3. And then is there anything else? Uh, this is, uh, I was making reference recently to the power centers in our body. And so this is the sun incarnate in heaven. This is the sun incarnate on the earth. And this is the sun incarnate in you. So here are the veils. Inside of veils. Inside of veils. It's really cool stuff. And these are the, this shows you how nine is a complete number rather than seven. Seven is a complete number for the mystics, for the six-day people, or what they don't know yet about. You know, they look at seven planes of existence. They don't realize how everything changes whenever you put woman back in the man and the man back inside the angel. Then they don't see how things complete. They're looking at an in, incomplete picture, but you get a, a little taste of what we're going to see in heaven later in the mystery explained it is it's it's the greatest work in my life for certain you have access to it for only 25 bucks uh, per year and uh, my apologies is only my fourth only did four mystery explained reports last year this is the fourth one here I'll try to do another one by the end of the year and uh, you know, update things a little bit Help you see a little more of God's hidden wisdom. You guys inspire me by sending your questions, like um, Anne and Michael did here. Appreciate your support again. Get more information right here at uh, tarot03.com down in the scripture section. You can subscribe down below. Get a copy of my book, The Mystery Explained. I'm wondering who's going to get number 80. It's been on the the block now for months and months and months. Seems like it's going to be somebody special with the numerology 80, the number of the new day. And completion. Maybe that's why nobody's going to get, nobody's woke up and realized that that it's available and what it means. And I uh, hope that you're getting your nanosaur, you're around for whenever we're taken. So even if you're just preparing spiritually, you want to protect your tabernacle so that you're going to be around. Whenever the 5G pulse sounds, it the world is going to change and people are going to perish within a week. Millions and then billions of people are going to perish. And you want to be still around whenever the final trump sounds. Appreciate your support again. Get more information here at tarot03.com. I'll see you on the next mystery report. Hopefully it comes sooner rather than later.